Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grillin' JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Connie. I'm good. Good to see your uh, jovial cheeks and your handsome uh, face. Uh, I'm glad to be back home in Jacksonville now. I move around a lot, you know. Yes, us sir. Tra us transients, us wrestling people, we, we, we relocate. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm in Jacksonville, and, and uh, I was like we were saying before I went on, we went on the air, you know, heck, uh, I got it. It's Monday morning. We're recording this on Monday morning. Uh, just to be tr transparent, which yeah. is a nice way to be. It's not always that way in wrestling kids and being honest. And it's not always that way kids. Uh, so, uh, I was looking at my, my, uh, my device. What's this thing called? Uh, iPhone, a tablet. Tablet. <laughs> I'm looking at my tablet and, uh, and I see a notice that I have a flight upcoming flight information. And I look, I said, wait a minute, that's tomorrow. I'm flying to Norfolk, Virginia tomorrow. Can that be? <laughs> so anyway, uh, the show never stops and we keep on rolling and, and to be honest with you, uh, there's no place I'd rather be than on the road doing AEW wrestling. That's my sanctuary. That's my safe place. If you will, I'm not a buzz. I'm trying to be cool and trendy and I'll try not to call you Thompson Conrad <laughs> or Brian Danielson, or Daniel Bryanson. Oh God. <laughs> Nobody cares. Listen, man, I, shake I, that I shit off. What a great job you had, uh, you know, calling an incredible pay-per-view putting incredible lyrics to some, uh, incredible music, if you will, this past week, I think, uh, I think people are going to be talking about full gear for a long, long time. And as everyone is listening to this, we had the, uh, the follow-up effort last night on dynamite rampage, of course, this Friday night, but man, hangman, Adam page, a star is born. You got a yeah. new camp. Yeah. He, uh, Adam had the, the night that he needed. Yeah. He had the performance more specifically that he needed. And, uh, give a lot of credit to Kenny Omega, you know, Omega's body's battered. He's got bad shoulders. Uh, he's got to, he's got to take some time. I, I don't know what he's going to do if I were him. And I'm sure Tony Khan's feeling somewhat the same way. Uh, you got to get the guys some rest. He's got to heal a little bit. And what, quite frankly, that's not a bad thing because he lost the title. Now he can not, not go invisible. But he could be less prominent on the shows as a wrestler and more as a personality until he's healthier. And, uh, but Kenny Omega deserves a hell of a lot of credit for making that match, uh, with Adam as good as it was. And, and here's the other thing about that, Connie, that, you know, wrestlers are, we're all the same. This crazy ass business. We're all paranoid. We're all insecure, all that stuff. That's all true. But I think that, uh, uh, you know, 
I think, I think, uh, Kenny just, he elevated, he, he made sure that the transition from himself to hangman page was spot on and it was. So, uh, I really enjoyed that, that, uh, their outing, but here's what I was going to say this, that was full gear was a hell of a show. And I'm not going to be monsooning it here and pat myself on the back, breaking my arm, but I think it was generally considered a hell of a show. Yes. Some matches are better than others and people's perce perception. And that's always going to be that way. Everything's not a tie. Everything's not four stars on the money or five stars or whatever. Uh, but I, I think that, uh, uh, to follow, to follow everything on the card with some of the best workers in the world, pre, you know, leading into your match, what do you do to make your match different? What do you do to tell a better story? What do you do to execute better? Uh, it's all there. It's all in front of you. That's a hell of a challenge for two guys because they knew when they went out there, I mean, this is the, it's like being on the, it's like being in baseball or, or, or being a quarterback in football and you're in your, you got a two minute drill here. You got to deliver. It's not an option. Well, we should deliver here. No, we can, we have to deliver here. And those guys really rose to the occasion. So I think, I think Paige is going to make a great champion. Yep. Uh, people are already talking about, uh, uh, Brian Danielson. I got it right. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> as the number one contender. So, uh, and, and that match will be one of the great experiences of hangman pages career. Brian Danielson is a maestro. Did I say it right there. Byron, I've got Brian. He, he's, he's unbelievable. I think he's arguably, you know, uh, not only the best wrestler in the world, but one of the best wrestlers of all time. And he's finally getting to show what he can do. And I'm excited for what's next. And people are going to be talking about this pay-per-view for a long, long time. And we hope you guys enjoyed dynamite last night with good old Jr. and probably catch him again next week, man. You're, you're back we on hope. the road. And next week, I think is the, uh, Chicago Thanksgiving tradition. You guys are doing again, right? Yeah. It's sold out. You know, it, it's just, uh, amazing. That city, if that's not the home, the home home base type thing of, uh, the hot spot for AEW, I don't know where it is because look at all the stuff we've done in Chicago this year and successfully, not just we have, well, that was okay. House, it was, you know, it's half full. This, this is the big building, I think downtown, uh, which I like because the hotels are close by, uh, and, uh, you get to fly out O'Hare on Thanksgiving morning. That's always a joy. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that we're just on a real good roll and there's more pieces coming and how Tony used Tony Khan uses them is certainly his prerogative. He, I'll say this, and I should say this, and I know it's going to come off as ass kissing, but it's not, uh, you know, Tony booked a hell of a show. Let's give the devil his due, so to speak. Uh, he booked a hell of a card and, uh, and, and, it, and one of the reasons he did it because he, ha he is always willing to receive the, uh, input of, uh, the talent. And I remember Bill Watts doing that time and time again, because I would be sitting in those meetings with the Cowboy and his main event guys when I was very, very young, taking notes. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> pardon me. So anyhow, uh, I I, uh, I really respect how Tony books, and he booked a hell of a card. And I thought that that, that it started off good. I think the match between MJF and and uh, and Darby Darby Allen was. Uh, kind of a pleasant surprise because they had a hell of a wrestling match and MJF is so it hasn't wrestled that much recently. He's disturbed he's, as a Hena would say he's tripped and passed nucks, uh, so to speak, but he, they, I thought they had a good match. It was a great start, a great opener, but if I had a chance to either you want to close the show in a pay-per-view or you want to start it, it's my philosophy. So anyway, I thought we did, did well there. It was kind of good to get back in the mid Atlantic, you know, and all that good stuff. So for this next week, then Chicago, and like, I, I think, I the, the Chicago, I, like I said, I'm pretty sure it's sold out, but I'm, I swear to it. So anyway, it's all good. Venice has been good. I'm going to next week's going to be a real, uh, kind of a touch and go week for me. I'm supposed to get on Monday morning. I'm supposed to get uh, two 
cancer spots uh, cut out of my back. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, you know, then they said, well, it's only a few stitches. Yeah, but I'll get, you know, get ready to get on an airplane and I got to get these things going to be bandaged. I can't scratch them. I can't touch them. I'll be doing this a lot like a dog or a horse like leading up to a tree. If I could just make that Mr. Ed smile, I'd be right on the money. Uh, so, uh, then on, then I'm supposed to go after that on Monday, I got to go to my oncologist and he's going to, uh, they're making me a boot, they call it. And the boot is what you slip on so that the, uh, radiation machine can have a target. And I don't know if it attaches or whatever, but it's, it's there to not give you any more radiation than you need and only on the spot that is affected. And then on uh, Wednesday, if I'm alive, I'm oh, kidding, kidding, Lord, uh, t Jan will tell you, I'm kidding. God, I don't want, I'm, I'm good. Uh, I just, uh, I plan on going to Chicago and I plan on going to Gibson's. <laughs> I am. I'm going to keep my life and I'm going to go to Gibson's and have a nice little steak. And, uh, and then uh, on Wednesday, we're, we're going to kick ass. And by the way, tickets are on sale right now. AEWTIX.com. still a handful of seats available. Uh, but this is going to be a fun show, man. And so is yep. today's show, by the way. Yeah. Let's get after it. We're talking about something that happened 20 years ago, survivor series, 2001. And we've really started to chronicle you know, everything that happened 20 years ago. And that's what we're going to keep up with today. What happened between, you know, no mercy 2001, which we've covered. And then last week's Chris Jericho, 2001. And now here we are essentially the end of the invasion. And boy, this had been a fantasy thing for years and years, especially if you went to the old newsstand and you saw the quote unquote after mags boy, for decades, they had all kinds of cover pages about what would happen if this guy from company yeah. a wrestled this guy from company B. And now we, we get it here in 2001 and it's just not what we hoped. Um, coming out of new mercy though, we have a new WCW champion in Chris Jericho, and now he's quickly being elevated to be the top heel. Steve Austin retains his WWF title, defeating both angle and Rob Van Dam in a three way and the undertaker defeated Booker T. So the next night at uh, raw in Kansas city, it's a star studded card, like everything in 2001, but even for the dark matches here, check this out. Chuck Palumbo would beat Randy Orton and Billy Gunn would beat Brock Lesnar. So, uh, some sort of tryout <laughs> matches, if you would, the dark matches here, getting some reps in front of the big crowd, Randy Orton and Brock Lesnar. I'm sure you could see right away. These guys are going to be studs. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I. When I signed Brock Lesnar, uh, with all of Jerry Briscoe's help, uh, he was a no miss guy, unless he self-destructed on the road for social issues goes for everybody. How do you, are you a good traveler? Are you a good locker room guy? Are you a good teammate? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I think it was a favor to both Randy and to Brock to work that show in front of a big crowd and learn how to lose and how to lose the right way because Conrad, I'm not going to say they, they learned in one match. The deal is, is that the locker room was going to be more willing to accept a Randy Orton and a Brock Lesnar who are, who, who they could see are going to threaten their spots. Mm. Uh, and I thought it would, it, it, it maintained some peace in the Valley and some order. Uh, those, both those guys losing them losing had nothing to do with the lack of confidence. Or are they going to make it? Are we still trying to decide if they're going to get here and the big roster, blah, blah, blah. That was already foregone conclusion, but I think for the locker room sake and their perception in the locker room, uh, doing the honors, even though it was dark, there's people there. Yeah. Uh, was a smart thing to do. So that was, I thought that was good booking. Uh, on raw that night, we would see Tajiri beat Billy Kidman to win the WCW cruiserweight title. Kurt angle would defeat Rhino to win the WCW us title. Bradshaw would defeat the hurricane to win the European title and Chris Jericho and the rock who just the night before had fought for the WCW title would defeat the Dudley boys to win the WWF tag straps. So literally the only wrestler from the invasion still holding a title is Rob Van Dam and he's hardcore champion. And then, uh, 
that same night at raw, just as Vince and Linda McMahon tease making out inside a ring, the challenge is made and accepted. It's going to be the WWF versus the Alliance in the main event of survivor series. And the losing team would have to disband to put this in perspective. The company purchased WCW in March. Here we are with the end of it in November, eight months, Yeah, eight months. Meltzer would say the WWF needs major changes. And I'm not confident. Anybody really knows what the changes need to be because the problems aren't as simple as those that killed WCW or that those changes will be coming, maintaining and going back the over 30 crowd goes against every way of thinking in that company. And I don't think anyone really knows what has lost the audience. I don't buy it's less emphasis on the matches. Although the long-term survival, that is part of the package that needs to change. Most of the shows themselves have contained good wrestling, at least by WWF standards. So while people complain about matches, there are problems like overdone ref bumps and a fear that without a gimmick finish, people will think it's a flat finish, but ultimately kills people taking wins and losses seriously, which hurts, uh, or which leads to far reaching problems. The writing, particularly the long-term writing is pretty bad. And the writers being the focal characters causes more problem. I think the long-term soap opera storylines, mainly the ones involving the top characters Far more than the in-ring product is what builds numbers. So let's take a timeout right there. I think everybody agrees with that. Matches are important, but we've got to have stakes. We've got to tell a story. People have to care. And it feels like for whatever reason, Jim, they just were not caring about this invasion, which seemed like our fantasy for decades, but an execution, it just fell flat. Well, I tell you, I think that the, uh, it was a, a gimmick finish smorgasbord a buffet of ref bumps and feet on the ropes and all these things. Uh, and when you have the talents that have a voice, that's what you can find because they're going to try to, if they're going to do the honors, they want to do the honors where they have an out. It's not enough to have a great match, uh, to have a, a match that has, uh, some parody as far as who's on offense, the most or on defense, the most or whatever, uh, it's, it's. It's just somewhere along the way, the fact that a talent could convince the old man or Pat Patterson or somebody else that they need more gimmicks in the match or more an ounce in the match. I've got to be protected shows me that their talents have the wrong perspective. And what is, what does the business mean Conrad seriously here when you can't lose another guy's finish? Yeah. What, I don't, I don't, you know what I mean? I don't get that. So if I'm going to, if I'm a wrestler, which pray to God that, that thank God that never happened, uh, to any degree, uh, it, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I just don't understand the reasoning behind it. And it's it. And, and AEW, for example, I don't know how we had some unique finishes on Saturday night in Minneapolis at full gear, but we had winners and losers. That's right. And the talents that. That, that dropped the falls. I never heard one person and that maybe they did whisper to their buddy. I can't believe I'm doing this. I don't, I don't think that ever happened, but I heard nobody complaining and bitching and moaning. The, 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 I always tell all of us that man, it's three seconds that, for that to take place. How long's your match? Well, we got 20 minutes. Okay. Then you got 19 minutes and 57 seconds to kick ass. That's how I look at it. And then the, the finish has got to got to be led right into perfect and fit like a glove. And I thought those guys did that, but our finishes became a gimmick is too many gimmick finishes and guys felt uncomfortable, even losing to, uh, another talents, a uh, finish move. Can you imagine the revolt? It would be if people had a problem at this show or shows lead subsequently into this show, if uh, putting Austin over with a stunner. He beat everybody with a stunner. That's how now that is how it's supposed to work. You, you, you win with your, you win with your finish. So anyway, it, it was a very troubling times. We were seen to be philosophically disjointed somewhat too many cooks in the kitchen. Maybe I don't know. I don't know exact reasons. I do know this, that angle was cut too short. It had a great future. 
if, uh, uh, and you had two leagues, you had a big enough roster to, to stock the shells of two shows and because of frustrations and politics and things of that nature, or so it seemed to me, the angle was said, okay, let's just get out of this deal. And, uh, and that caused a lot of issues we'll talk about here today. I get it. It's a wrestling podcast, but he's saving us money on our mortgage. You really trust this process. The reviews don't lie. Five-star review after five-star review. We make it fast. We make it easy and it's no cost or obligation. Give us a shot to earn your business. I'm telling you, you'll be glad you did, especially if you like keeping more of your own money. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. So what are you waiting for? Hurry to save with Conrad.com. Let's also mention uh, another quote from Meltzer here. Perhaps the biggest frustration is that everyone knows the multi-million dollar angle that will turn the thing around, but it requires getting Bischoff, Goldberg, et cetera, and requires the McMahons to be vulnerable and requires the long-term wrestlers to accept the idea that because business is bad, some guys need to be jump-started ahead of existing. And in most cases, better talent. It's also mentioned here as he wraps up his, uh, his diatribe here. It's not happening now. And it feels like we're in a holding pattern waiting for, of all people, Kevin Nash to save the day. And that's not a position I'd like to gamble the industry on, but I do think that he sort of hits the nail on the head in order for this thing to have really worked. The McMahons would have had to at least momentarily allowed the perception that, uh, oh, WCW is going to kick our ass and they probably didn't want to do that. And they would have had to open up the checkbook to get Eric Bischoff to lead this group. Not one of the McMahons. Well, and- here's, here's the thing. And I don't need to cut you off, but the, while I'm thinking about it, it takes two to tango. Sure. Some of those guys that have been mentioned here, Kevin Nash, et cetera, et cetera. How do we all know that they were wanting to get back on the road, wanting at the latter stages of their career? Cause all of them are. Uh, you know, had, had 20 years or so experience. They've been battered at its surgeries and all this stuff. How do we all know that they wanted to get back on the road? Well, I can, I can tell you who knows. I know they weren't interested and they were going to let their contracts play out with time Warner because time Warner was paying a handsome sum to those individuals. So I, there's a, there's a two, there's two def- definitive ways to looking at this thing is the uh, Meltzer right that if we had our the full complement of talents and we had Goldberg and, you know, all the other guys that had, you know, Hall and Nash and all that good stuff, Eric, certainly Eric would have been perfect, but you know, and I'm not saying Eric didn't want to come to work. I don't know that he did or he didn't. Cause I don't think he and I had a conversation about that at that point in time, but it was finally decided that he would come to work and he did a good job, did a real good job. Uh, uh that hug he had with McMahon on the stage was epic. And, uh, I thought Eric did a great job. He beat me in a match on raw and got color. What's he want? <laughs> so anyhow, uh, uh, but it, it, does, it take, I want to, some of it, it takes two to tango. Some of those guys just didn't want to come back on the road. They weren't ready to come back on the road yet. And those that have been off Conrad wanted to make sure their bodies are right. Make sure they were healthy. They look good. They're in show shape. And you can't get in show shape, just be, being off work. You still got to train and prepare for it. And, and some of the guys just, uh, didn't seem to be motivated for that at that time. But isn't uh, that part of the other side of the coin? Like if you don't have the right talent for this angle, maybe wait and do it when you do. Well, I think the, th- yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think the but I think what we thought was what we had, uh, combining all the talent, the Booker T's of the world from WCW, sure. et cetera, et cetera, uh, and mixing them in with some established WWE guys with a great name identity was enough. Yeah. Uh, I think that was the thought we hoped it would be enough because there just wasn't any chance at that time to get to those other guys we talked about. It would have made my job a lot easier. Uh, but, uh, it just, it just didn't, it just didn't work out. I want to mention this show that we just recapped here, this Monday night raw is one night after the no mercy pay-per-view, which was a decent card, but it fell to its lowest rating in its normal time slot for a non holiday show 
since March 30th, 1998. To put that in perspective, that's before Raw was able to end the 83 week streak of Monday Nitro. And that was against a Nitro and Monday Night Football. But boy, it's starting to taper off here in a major way. Um, I also want to mention there's, uh, some other news from that episode of raw Meltzer would write RVD pin show after a Van Daminator and a frog splash in 445. Originally, this match was supposed to be Rob Van Dam versus undertaker plan. A was for RVD to win, but kind of give it to give him some steam coming off the pay-per-view loss plan B. Not because Taker refused to do the job, but because several agents felt it would send a bad message for RVD to beat Taker, at least to the dressing room. They set up a finish where Austin would interfere and cost RVD the match. With Austin out, they couldn't come to any sort of agreement, so they just scrapped it and put show in the spot instead. Do you remember there being some, I don't know, backlash against Rob Van Dam? This is interesting to me that, hey, we can't have Rob Van Dam beat The Undertaker. What sort of message does that send to the locker room? That seems silly to me, Jim. It is silly, Conrad, and uh, I didn't know the our agents uh, were so benevolent and so caring and warm. <laughs> uh, and they thought it was the right political thing to do. They were trying to protect Taker. I understand their loyalty and I admire that, but uh, Taker had no issues doing business. I think, I think that one of RVD's, uh, uh, strikes was the fact that he was being endorsed so strongly by Heyman. I see. Heyman and, is, is your commentary partner, just to give context for that. Uh, this is yeah. the era where, where Lawler's out. So he's probably beating that drum pretty hard. And maybe that's rubbing some guys the wrong way. I like that. I, it, it could have been that way. Cause Paul could be very abrasive. If he had the audience to be abrasive in front of. Right. And, and he's also very cerebral because he's so goddamn smart. And I'm not saying that in a facetious way. Yeah. He really is, but he could be dogged. He'd be a great salesman. <laughs> he so, is uh, a great salesman. Yeah, he is. Look at him now. He's yeah. uh he's a difference maker on in WWE. For sure. And, and I'm happy for him. He's still a friend of mine. He was always a friend of mine. We are we argue like cats and dogs, but you know, it's uh so what? Right. I thought I thought we had a good team. I thought he and I did well together. I enjoyed working with him because he he generally would figure out a way to piss me off. And when he did, then I would be red ass Jr. before red ass Jr. was making hot sauce. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that had an issue that, that Ross biggest advocate, no pun intended here was Paul Heyman and Paul Heyman had some issues with some older decision makers and older agents, because he was more of a contemporary thinker. He was very smart. And sometimes Paul will come up with things that they, even though they, they, they may have tried to shoot holes in, it just didn't work. He was a smart guy. So I think that was the issue there because you can't say it was Rob Van Dam's ability, right? Rob Van Dam was, a, was great in the ring. And then one of my favorite guys to watch and call matches for, uh, just, uh, he, 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 he kept reinventing himself. He kept bringing in, introducing new things into his repertoire. And people, and he got over, he got over. So instead of going with what's getting over again, decisions like this are what made that, uh, Alliance thing, uh, so, uh, fail. Uh, and, and I don't know that Vince ever had confidence in it. Uh, I was surprised that we did it. I was even more surprised that we cut it short because I thought that they, this show, as we'll talk about here, that match was the show. In my opinion, not to denigrate any of the other boys and ladies on the show, uh, but that one match, uh, that elimin and I love the fact it was an elimination match. Uh, the boys didn't like it because that meant you got a lot of finishes, right? Oh, I don't get, what do I, I got to protect myself. Can you imagine trying to come up with something that's going to protect nine finishes? No, silly. It, it's a little silly, but, but they, they get back on the right track with what they're trying to accomplish with Rob Van Dam. The next day at SmackDown in Omaha, uh, we would see the Dudleys defeat the Hardys to win the WCW tag titles. And then unbelievably with a little help from test and Booker T Rob Van Dam beats the rock. So what they were trying to do on raw with the undertaker 
The rock steps up and does it here at SmackDown. Uh, the next week at raw Brock Lesnar and Shelton Benjamin are going to team up and, uh, they're going to defeat the OVW tag team champions, the prototype and Rico Constantino, by the way, the prototype is John Cena. How about that? Brock Lesnar, John Cena, Shelton Benjamin. This is before the cameras are rolling. That's wild, dude. The, the, the next level, the next class of, of talent is just unbelievable. Yeah. And I think that we're trying to get to that. Yeah. It's just, you know, there's a, there's a method to this madness. We are trying to get to the fact that it was obvious. We we're going to use Lesnar and Orton and Cena and Shelton and Batista. All those guys are in one class that we sent to OVW. So, uh, it was just a matter of how do we bring them in with some sort of fanfare that is significant and it will enhance and quick, quicken their name identity and, uh, their ability to get over. So, uh, but we were on that road and I think that was, that was a decision I think that having those guys may have been one of the main reasons that Vince wanted to say, we're done with this deal. We're done with it. Cause I got guys coming that are young and new and fresh, and this is where we're headed. We're going here. We're not going there. Uh, I wanted to mention, since you brought up OVW, the observer would report quote, Jim Ross met with Jim Cornette, Les Thatcher and Danny Davis for four hours on October 29th in Louisville before raw to talk about developmental talent. Everyone was high on Rico being ready. Although there was a little concern over his comedic style in the ring. There's a strong feeling to not rush Lesnar out there because he isn't ready. The Goldberg push was talked about, but the feeling was after that his weaknesses due to the lack of fully understanding of the business, since he didn't really grow up a fan would work against him. Lesnar's developmental contract is significantly higher than most because there was serious interest from both WCW and new Japan. Because of that, there is this innate pressure to get him to the big show just to justify the deal. Do you remember this meeting talking about, Hey, what are we going to do with all these boys with Cornette Thatcher and Davis? Well, uh, yeah, I remember it because it was, it was a significant meeting. There was a, I didn't have the, even though I liked, uh, Rico a lot class guy. Uh, I, I didn't have the confidence. I think Cornette might've been his biggest, uh, supporter, but I might be wrong on that. I, I don't think anybody was against him, but I didn't have the high opinion. That he was going to be a main event guy, uh, as some of the others, which only meant we had a difference of opinion, but, uh, we wanted to make sure that we didn't screw up, uh, the other guys that we were talking about Lesnar's and, and, you know, all those dudes, Cena, uh, Randy. You know, I, I said this before, and that, that was one of the greatest classes that we've ever signed. Uh, and, uh, and the best athlete of the group was not Brock Lesnar. It was Shelton Benjamin. And, uh, uh, so I thought I had high hopes for Shelton and I don't think Shelton, even to this very day has gotten the, uh, breaks or the accolades that he has, he deserves, or he, he could have, he could, he could, uh, he could have been a major star in singles or tags but he was relegated in tags because that was a good way to good placeholder, I suppose. And, you know, in regards to the meeting being four hours, Conrad, you've got to understand it was all about food. We had lunch. Oh, there you go. And, and it took longer. It was on Vince's tab. So everybody ate good. <laughs> good for you. And yeah. So, uh, yeah, I remember it. I love working with those guys in OVW. OVW was one of the biggest assets, uh, that the WWE ever had. Uh, they certainly were the forerunner to the performance center and all those things. Uh, you know, when you got rock Lesnar driving the ring truck and all the wrestlers, all the wrestlers involved in being on the ring crew, we weren't going to hire ring crew guys. Look at, there's a bunch of them right there. Let's get those guys to do this. And because Lesnar grew up on the farm in South Dakota, and was, had been grown up driving a tractor and pickup trucks and other things. Uh, he was nominated to be the the foreman and he loved that. He loved that. So, uh, and he was a, he was a good one. So yeah, I remember the meeting and it, it was a good meeting. I thought, and I, I hope the other guys would say that to this day, but, uh, the only, the only thing I can remember negatively or in a, in a somewhat of a little bit of a cloud event would be, uh, the confidence that some had in Rico being a main event guy and some of us, especially me that thought he could contribute 
he'd be great in the locker room. He'd be a reliable, solid hand, but he ain't going to hit fourth. He's a seven or eight or nine hole hitter. And, but, but he's on the team. He could be, he could contribute, but just not to the level that some perceive that he might. So RVD coming off the big win here over the rock gets pinned by edge. Kurt angle would defeat William Regal with an ankle lock. And then in the main event, Kurt angle turns on the WWF to help Shane McMahon pin Vince McMahon. So angle who's being pushed as the top baby face, the Olympic gold medalist and the hero coming off of nine 11 turns heel. Jim, the creative here is just all over the place in hindsight. This has got to be even frustrating to hear. I can't imagine you trying to sort of put lyrics to this. <laughs> what, what can you tell us about after all of this that we've done with angle, we got to do something right to sell the pay-per-view. Well, what if we turn him heel? Well, there's a lot of knee jerk here, pal. There's a lot of the booking was like you said, all over the place. And generally when one drives a vehicle all over the place, the vehicle does not have a clearly defined destination. And we had no destination there. We had a lot of parts a part over here and a part over there and, and so forth. But it was just, uh, the, the direction was lacking big time. Again, a lot of cooks in the kitchen. We talked about, uh, some of the agents and that means Pat Patterson to me and I, nobody respected Pat still does this day more than me. I promise you. But he had a lot of influence and he was stubborn. Uh, and when those guys talk Vince out of RVD beating the undertaker to put RVD elevate RVD, look at what we did for Jeff Hardy in that ladder match with the undertaker and Jeff lost, but the undertaker made sure he had a great showing and Jeff Hardy got over in a losing effort. Remember what the, all the guys say, yeah, now they say it. Uh, it's not who goes over it's who, it's who gets over. Well, it's right. always been that way. It's not a new deal. It's not a new concept. So, uh, I, 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 this, we seem to, we, I don't want to say we were, we were rudderless because we weren't totally rudderless. This just wasn't sure where he wanted to sail or you want to take that big yacht, what Island, where do you want to go? And, and so it was, uh, it took a little time to get that done. I want to mention, um, there's a lot written in the observer about some, uh, frustrations in the locker room that you had this harmonious, perfect business model, just one year prior, but now because business is down on the heels of WrestleMania 17 with turning Steve Austin heel, and you've got all of these new talents coming in. Some of the lower or mid card guys have started to get booked less and less on house shows. So they're earning less money. And the yeah. crowds are down because of the poor creative that the, maybe the whole Austin thing was the first domino to fall him turning heel. So if you get booked, you're probably going to make a lot less money than you did last year, but that's still an if, because now it's getting awfully crowded. Now for a lot of folks, that's just whatever, but for Jim Ross, when he's running talent relations, boy, you're trying to keep a lot of unhappy people just satisfied. How yeah, frustrating yeah. was this as an administrator for you? Well, it was challenging. And that job was always frustrating. Uh, cause he, he wore many hats again, no pun intended. You know, he had to be a clergyman. You got to be a financial advisor. You got to be a father confessor. Uh, you, you got to be a good listener. Uh, so it was challenging and, and the, here's the frustrating. The most frustrating thing is I was not able to answer their questions adequately. I didn't know the future. I didn't know where we were going with this thing. I don't know what the business plans for you are. Now, did I, would I try to, uh, ascertain the answers to those things? Absolutely. But I, they left my office, not getting everything addressed that they came to talk about. So it was very frustrating. And I felt bad for some of the guys because here's what you find out. And I, this is one of the reasons I, I, I preached on this so many times, save your money. Have a plan, uh, you know, have a plan that where you can have a, the old plan B of course, but if something disastrous occurs, you're still, uh, you're able to survive 
and to pay your bills and to maintain your, your family unit. Uh, nonetheless, all the guys that got hurt and wrestled for us got paid. And then it goes back to their downside guarantee. They got paid their, if you're, your if you're downside guarantee, and this is a, this is a number because it's easy math for me. If your downside guarantee was 52 grand a year, that means you're making a thousand dollars a week. Follow me there, Connie. Yes, sir. Got that. You're the, you're the fucking mortgage guy. <laughs> you got, you know how to do math. So, uh, that's where we were. Uh, and they were worried that they couldn't live on their downside guarantee. And I can understand that as well. So, you know, the only thing you can tell them is that, you know, we'll help you if we can, or something you get in such a, don't lose your home. Don't do something. Let's not let you have something happen. That's just disastrous, but you know, we got to communicate and on your end, you have to make changes. Well, I don't want to make any changes. Well, you have to make changes because you're not earning the money to, to sustain the lifestyle that you had established while being on the road. And a lot of guys didn't want to hear that, you know? So, uh, it was, uh, it was frustrating and I, and I, and I was one, I liked the idea of the, uh, of this brand split and the, and the Alliance angle. I, I, I didn't have any issues with that. Uh, cause I thought long-term it could be really good. It's the same thing that when I talk when Bill Watson, I talked to, uh, uh, Rob Garner and Jimmy Crockett, uh, about selling uh, UW, UWF to them, uh, and, and Crockett promotions, you can have your own super bowl. You can have, you know, if, to keep all your, again, politics to keep all your incumbents and the beloved NWA happy. So Jimmy didn't have to listen to everybody coming in and, you know, where's my TV time. What are we going to do about TVS, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you could have shared that time on TVS in an organized way. And you could have had, you could have got all your talents over and occasionally have a trade, uh, occasionally have a, a turncoat, occasionally have a guy come in that, that everybody's bidding for. And it could have been great little stories, easy to understand, easy to write, very easy to execute, but that's not, and, and then at the end of the year, once, once a year, right there, you have a, you have your Super Bowl. And you should get a, a, you, that could be your WrestleMania and JCP, but it just, again, because of je jealousies and insecurities with decision makers, paranoia runs deep. And what's that song deep, and deep in my heart, it will seep. It starts when you're always afraid, step out of line, the man come and take you away. Who sings that song? Somebody will answer that this week. Uh, anyhow. That's, that's how I, I, I visualized it. And it's just one day we're all hot about it. It's going to be great. The next day we're not. And then when you got, when you have a plan and then somebody is able to use their influence to go to Vince and change it the day of RVD was going to wrestle undertaker that morning. Then there's a conversation to help. And no, that ain't going to happen. Then ironically rock does it. Yeah. And, but that's not, that's not fit the rock against taker and who didn't want to do what undertaker have been fine doing it. Of course he really would, man. He's a pros pro he's Clint Eastwood, man. He's going to ride into town, shoot. who has got to shoot, get shot when he's got to get shot. And he's going to move on to the next scene. So that's kind of where we were there, Connie. I just, uh, it was very frustrating at times and my phone rang all the time in the middle of the night, early morning. I just couldn't sleep JR. I got to talk to you. Okay. Let me get out of bed. <laughs> let me put, let me get my PJs on or whatever. Meltzer would be pretty critical of the creative saying that they're just grasping at straws creatively to try to make fans care. And in the process, as they're flip-flopping the title so often it's rendered them meaningless. And now in an effort to make something special, it feels like nothing is. Meltzer would say the upcoming survivor series is the epitome of all these problems. Either the WWF or the Alliance goes and numerous people are to be out of a job come November 18th. According to the storyline, of course, nobody believes the storyline, nor should they, well, they had, they had long-term contracts, right? The, the, we're, we're sometimes we allow ourselves. And I just, I'm the same way, Connie to mix reality with the fiction of pro wrestling. 
I, I think they mean from a fan standpoint, like the fans know, Hey, these guys are signed. They're not leaving. Right. And because it feels like, you know, there's no real stakes here. Ticket sales are abysmal quote pro proof of that is ticket sales for Greensboro at press yeah. time. There were only 6,528, meaning half the Coliseum is unsold. This comes on the heels of the live raw at the Nassau Coliseum, which only drew 7,629 fans. Up until this summer, the WWF had sold out every event in the New York Metro area dating back to 1998. Now, after rock versus Austin couldn't come close to selling out MSG, they didn't come close to selling out a live raw either. At any point during this, do you remember Vince or anybody else in the inner circle sort of hitting the panic button? Panic button might be a little extreme, but then again, it's once for, for uh, perception of that event, that situation, uh, we knew we had to get some people over in the roles that they were, you know, also need to be a baby face. That was, that was a hell that was easy to figure out. I think, uh, he was the biggest star we had. He and rock rock didn't change rock didn't go heel. So there are two matinee idol stars, uh, fan favorites needed to be in that role. And we also, we, and we, you know, to Conrad, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, biased on this topic. I thought we had a hell of a roster. Oh, for sure. And if you look at, when we talked about this last match on the show today, it's a hall of fame match. Look at how many guys in that match are hall of fame in the hall of fame or a hall of fame. And how many have earned financial security in this wacky ass world of pro wrestling. I, I I'm going to defend that roster to the, to the, my last breath. And so I, I I'm just, I, I can't, I can't blame it on the roster. I blame it on the creative and, and, and having no direction. There needed to be stronger presence in the creative room that could reach Vince and maybe guys like, uh, Bruce or Pat or me, whatever should have been more. And maybe they were in their own way. Maybe I was in my own way, but I think there was a point in time there where he just wasn't quite sure what to fucking do. I know I'm about to ask a silly question that you're going to laugh at, but we know seven months after this. The WWF would be no more. It would become WWE. So clearly that lawsuit is ongoing. Do you think anyone ever even presented the idea? Clearly it was never going to happen, but do you remember anyone ever saying, Hey, what if we go the other way? What if WCW won and we just rebranded ourselves as world championship wrestling? No, that's a quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> Vince is not gonna, the, the WWE is his life. Right. And, uh, it's his passion. He created it. And uh, as we know it today, for sure. Uh, and uh, yes, there was a great platform established for him from, from his dad and all the, all the partners are involved. Uh, this is inner Vince seniors, inner circle. Uh, they did a great job of, of running a very healthy territory and making guys. That's why all the boys want to go in the, in the territory days. Want to go to New York? I got off, oh, man. Once you get in New York, man, you can make some serious money. Nobody say anything about saving it, but you, know, you can make some serious money. Uh, but I, I, I just don't think that there was any, ever any discussion on that deal. And I think it could have been done, uh, very successfully. And with the WWE name as it became, that was hard to get used to. Yeah. And that was another big distraction for McMahon. WWF was. His D his, his, his creation. And now a court in England is going to ban you from using your own initials and your, you know, uh, the world wildlife fund, which again was what a, I thought, and this has nothing to do for you animal lovers. Cause I'm an animal lover myself. Uh, it had nothing to do with, uh, their cause and their, what they were created to do. Speaking of WWF, the world wildlife foundation whatever it's called. Uh, but it had everything to do with uh, having to rebrand everything, everything. The WWF initials were forbidden to be seen or, or, and so we went to WWE and world wrestling entertainment, which I think speaks volumes of where Vince's head was. Yeah. This show and our booking 
trying to resemble uh, a situation where we're trying to get a, a multi-layered soap opera with a huge ensemble cast all on the same page. Uh, and it's a great concept to be all on the same page, but it, there were times during that era of Conrad where we couldn't find the book to get to that page. It just, it just was so disjointed. It was, uh, disheartening. And, uh, so uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think that WC everything would ever have been even been considered, but it's, it's an interesting question for this sort of conversation. Let's talk about, um, the, the next show here, it's built around Vince teasing. Someone from the Alliance is going to jump to the WWF. So it's become mental warfare and he's trying to create distrust with the leader of the Alliance, uh, Steve Austin, eventually SmackDown is taped and Taz is stunned by Austin. And as a result, you step up and take over on commentary. What'd you think of this creative and what this meant for you? Hey, we're going to, we're going to put it on, uh, on Taz here, the paranoia of Steve Austin. So Jim go do SmackDown. <laughs> well, I was happy Vince had confidence in me to, uh, to, to do my job, uh, quite frankly. But, uh, it was an interesting angle, you know, Taz, Taz is really over in the beginning. No, no doubt. You know, we, I said this before he was mishandled, uh, and they got an injury early on. We just started getting kind of rolling, uh, which was very disheartening for him, especially, uh, but it was unfortunate because it essentially that injury killed his future. He, he was, you know, he comes in and debuts at the garden and guess who he beats. Kurt angle and angle hadn't had too many L's at that point in time. So I had a lot of confidence in Taz. That's why I signed him. I thought he could help us, but you know, again, uh, taller heels that had influence. He had a, he had a, the jury was already stacked and I didn't really realize it to what degree people would go to, you know, uh, he's not safe. He's unsafe and all this other stuff. So, uh, but, but I, I, I thought that it kind of was impactful, uh, what Steve did. And it really is all about Steve, not about Taz. It's about getting Austin some shine spotlight. And then me coming out there and helping out, uh, on commentary was, it's a, it was another day at the office for me and what I enjoyed doing, but I knew that it was all about Steve and if it's all about Steve. I'm all in. Meltzer had uh, something to say about Steve. He says Austin volunteered to put the undertaker over on SmackDown in exchange for being able to stun angle and reintroduce the beer spot as a step into his baby face turn. At this point, Austin with the backing from Jim Ross is trying to turn face, which others as mentioned last week are still against. It appears Austin's idea is to be a lone wolf. Like sting was in 1997. Austin saw the writing on the wall when his merchandise sales went down so badly. The Austin promo on that SmackDown was edited down several minutes, mainly the crowd chanting for RVD and Austin goading them by yelling what? So let's talk through this. He felt like maybe he was getting a little stale and he wanted to turn heel. And we saw what happened at WrestleMania 17. Now the business is taking a dump and so is his merchandise. And I'm sure he got one of those quarterlies and thought, uh, maybe not. What do you remember about him? Second guessing being a heel. Well, that uh, we could, you could monetarily and statistically ver uh, validate the fact that that was the wrong creator decision. Yeah. All of a sudden you get a guy that's selling more merchandise than anybody in history of the company. And now he's not, and it's, it's dropped drastically and that significant money. I've said this before on the show that there was one quarter where he got a, a million dollar royalty check selling t-shirts. Yeah. And so when those numbers drop significantly, it's a, it's a significant amount of money. It's not a, well, he was only making a hundred grand a quarter. No, no, no. He was making a lot more than that. Millions, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that million dollar one was just one I remembered because it was pretty significant. It, it, it validated my point to Steve at that point in time that him turning baby face, uh, from being that, uh, that lame ass ringmaster character that he didn't like, I don't know who did. And he, uh, you know, it, it, Hey, look, you turn baby face, you're getting over organically the best way, the right way. And 
at some point they're going to start buying your merch. And I think they're going to buy a lot of it. And, uh, I'd give him some numbers without names, uh, some guys royalty checks, and that intrigued him. Steve is a, it's all about the money. He's got the right percep perception of what the business is. It's about the money. I watched a thing the other day on, uh, maybe, maybe Sunday night or sometime, uh, interview with Bobby Heenan and Heenan says, you get in the wrestling business for anything, but the money you're making a mistake from the get go. That's what it's all about. You got to protect your investment. You got to create uh, protect your brand. And he, he broke down how to be a heel manager in about 10 seconds, 30 seconds, max than anybody I've ever heard because he may have been the very best manager that I ever saw. And I've, I've got to work with some really, really good managers, including Cornette, including Heyman, uh, JJ, all these guys who were good in their own way, but Heenan was, was the president of the class. He, he, he graduated with honors. Uh, so it's just, uh, I don't know. I, I, I just think you go with what the audience wants. They give us great market research. Let's use it. They use it. Let's just use it. So, uh, and we stopped using it. We stopped using it. And then when the money, when the, when the merch started going sliding for Steve, I think he, he realized, Hey, look, it was fun to try. We thought we'd give it a shot. Maybe if it worked, then it's a different story. It didn't work. So now we've got to move on and readjust. We've got to change quarterbacks. We've got to change offenses. And that's kind of what we did there. So Meltzer would say. Ross said with all the injuries, he's recapping your Ross report. Ross said with all the injuries, this is the time for people to step up and get noticed. The only problem is you have to be booked as a star nine times out of 10 before the fans will treat you as one and nobody is being elevated to the superstar level in the booking. It's always two steps forward and two steps back booking these days. People call it 50, 50 booking Jim. Yeah. Is this the era where you think that started to become more of an issue? You've got to placate all of these top guys and it just becomes a real challenge. Yeah, it does. And you know, I know, I think Vince in today's world, cowboy Bill Watts in his always world would have said, if you're unhappy, let's just get your ass out of here. If you're not, if this isn't working, I can't be, I can't solve all your ills. And I disagree somewhat with Dave and I respect Dave's knowledge and it, in his track record, a great deal, but you know, it's not, it, the talents can do something about it. You can go with ideas, you can make suggestions and you can make sure that you maximize your minutes. Every time you go out there, whether it's a match that you're losing or you're winning or against an opponent, that's not up to your speed, whatever it is, there's no excuses. You have to perform and ma maximize your minutes. That's what I was trying to say there. Uh, and, and hopefully somebody's going to squeeze themselves into notoriety to some degree. And, uh, I mean, I mean that to me, that works. It's funny how AEW can build such a successful brand, uh, in uh, this length of time. Uh, and they've done it. Tony Khan has done it with finishes. We have finishes. You mentioned, well, that's kind of simple. Hell that's easy. No, well, it's not always been that way. Everybody's got to have an out. You gotta protect me, brother. How am I protected? What's it do for me? Well, your performance in the match is going to do for you. That three seconds it takes to lose, uh, ain't going to be the end of your career. If you're that tentative as a character and as a performer and that unskilled, then maybe you need to figure out another line of work. That's all I'm saying. And I'm not disagreeing totally with Dave, but the talent have more to do with their success than is oftentimes perceived. It's easy to rely on the, well, creative was bad. That's why, that's why I didn't get over it. Creative killed me. But what did you do to, to, you recognize that issue. What did you do to counteract it? What did you do to try to correct it? And most of them don't have an answer because they didn't do a damn thing, The bitch and cash their checks. Well, let's talk about somebody else. Who's looking to cash some checks. Mr. Rick flair. It's in the observer that he's talking with the company and, uh, Meltzer would say it comes down to the same thing. It always has, which is whether or not they'll pay him what he can make staying home. Flair's book due for a release next fall. That would give flair the incentive to get back on television somewhere at that point to help push the book. Do you remember having conversations with Rick about trying to come in? You know, when I read this, uh, run through early this morning, I tried to think about that. I'm sure that Rick and I had some conversations. 
I was, a, I was, and still am a big Ric Flair supporter. Uh, I wish him only nothing but the best. Uh, you can't be in my role in talent relations and have the opportunity to get a talent, the stature and the, and the, with the name identity and the skills of Ric Flair and not endorse it. Uh, I was all for it, but I think, uh, you know, as I learned going forward, some talents react better negotiating with Vince than, than they would with me because there's it's, it's a, it's then the perception that the boss is doing my deal. And if that's what it's going to take to get you sign your paper, your contract, then hell, I don't care. I didn't, I didn't get a bonus for signing people. That was my job. So, uh, I don't remember having specific conversations, Conrad, but I certainly, uh, endorsed the fact that if we could get Ric Flair on a roster, that's what we should do. We, uh, get to November 8th and the company lays off 39 employees, including the president, Stu Snyder. How does that come to be? What can you tell us about Stu Snyder? Well, you know, Stu was a Turner guy came over from Turner and Stu did help orchestrate the buying of the, all, all we did was basically buy the WCW library. You know, that's what, that's the, that's how they went. That's how they rolled out. There was no big money exchange. It was significant money. Probably wouldn't be for you, but billionaire Connie. I saw that. Oh on my money. gosh. Listen to that. <laughs> that's that Gerald Briscoe stuff. Knock that off. Yeah. Mr. McMahon. Yeah. Uh, I love Gerald. I saw a picture of him online the other day and I, t I tweeted it back. He looked like Tommy Lee Jones playing the wolf man. He's, he's classic. I love Gerald. We've been on so many trips. I learned so much from him. Uh, he was a great listener and God almighty. I, I would vent to him more than anybody. He was my guy. We rode together and, uh, just the two of us a lot. And I knew that I could trust him. He never, Gerald Briscoe, never, ever violated my trust. Not one time. And I, and, and our, you say, well, what's the big deal about that? JR it's a big deal in wrestling. When you find somebody that won't violate your trust. And, uh, that was Jerry. I love Jerry still do. Uh, so I, I don't know where I was, but, but nonetheless, uh, Stu Snyder. Oh, Stu. Yeah. Stu had no product knowledge running a wrestling company that was trying to become more. And I think Stu had done something with the cartoon network and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm trying to reach back there. I didn't have a great rapport with him. I just seen him a lot. Uh, a little guy that kind of had that little Napoleonic con, con, you know, personality. Uh, and I remember him having an issue. And I, when Vince found this out, it was, it was the beginning of the end. Stu did not want, did not want to ride in a black limousine because he had, he had, he had a limo and he sure as hell didn't want a black driver. And when Vince found out that he only wanted white limousines and white drivers, as I remember it, uh, that was the nails started being driven in the coffin. So I, I'm not, I mean, I'm glad Stu was able to negotiate a, a good deal to buy the library. Holy shit. I had not heard that story. Yeah, he was, he, and I didn't know, I don't, it just it didn't, it didn't, it didn't work right. And I tell you, and one of the people, and some of the people, maybe more than one actually in travel, cause I would meet with travel because, you know, talents had issues and center seats and blah, 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 because they're too fucking lazy to go online and manage their own seating on a, on, on air, their airline apps or, or, or go online and get their sleep, select their seat. They took potluck when they got to the airport and then all of a sudden they found out they're in 34 F and it's in the middle seat or something along those lines, but they would say, you know, he's, he's a very unique guy about his travel. And, and I said, what do you mean? And well, you know, he, he didn't want a black driver. What? He didn't want to run any black limousines. So, uh, I know the black driver is true. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm thinking here now. I don't know that it was, he, he didn't want a white limo or a black limo, but there was something about that. Who gives a shit Conrad? It's a limo. You're getting a chauffeur driven ride to wherever you're going. What difference does it make? What color the car is and especially what color the driver is. And I think, uh, when Vince got word of that, any confidence that he had in Stu 
to continue there and be a significant con contributor started to disappear. Holy cow. Um, I don't even know how to respond to that, but yeah, that's weird, dude. Um, well, nobody knew, I mean, you're not going to, in a job interview, you don't, you no. don't ask people about their, maybe we should, I don't know, maybe, but I never did ask people what their politics were, their religion was, or their, their, their thoughts on race relations, uh, things of that nature. I just didn't, you know, it just didn't come up in the interview process. Maybe it should have, I don't know, but, uh, that was that deal, but I, I noticed right off the bat, you know, Stu thinking he was comparing wrestlers to cartoon characters. Yeah. It doesn't work. And it's just, they're real, they're real humans with real feelings and treat them as such. Let's talk about the uh, raw on the 12th. Mick Foley cuts. What's essentially a farewell promo. Meltzer would write fans were happy to see him, but he didn't seem happy. And it came across. He basically said he wouldn't be around much longer. Storyline was if Alliance won, he'd be out of a job, but if the WWF won, he'd also be out of a job because he didn't want to work for Vince that took the crowd down. He also mentioned that the previous week when TV was in Nassau and the Meadowlands, that he was there both nights, but they had nothing for him. And he seemed upset in particular that on long Island, where he grew up, they couldn't find a reason to get him on raw, which was a true story. And, uh, it feels like he's probably burnt out and just ready to ride off into the sunset. Do you remember him? expressing how frustrated he was with you at this point. He wasn't so frustrated with me, uh, cause I didn't do the booking, uh, of the, of the, do the creative, but it is a head scratcher. Why on his home turf, a big star like Nick Foley wasn't on the card in some way. He's so versatile. He could have done a lot of things. He could cut a promo, could have wrestled. He could have done tags, uh, whatever. Uh, it's just funny to me that that couldn't be done. And I think to me, it goes back to the fact that, well, he's been here a long time. He's a, he's like that old comfortable pair of ugly house shoes. You just don't want to throw away. Cause they, your feet slip right into the house shoe very simply and very, very easily. I think he was uh, taken for granted a lot, quite frankly. And let's remember when he first came to WWE, WWF, he was not at the top of the wish list. And I think that had a latent, you know, uh, and then he, he got over despite everything around him. Uh, and so anyway, I, I, I felt bad for Mick, you know, he did, he deserved better. He deserved better. And, uh, but you know, the, the jury had cast his verdict apparently. Well, uh, we're going to get a 20 minute Margaritaville promo that people still remember to this day with Steve Austin. And, um, and, and, and the rock, but I don't know what that does to really sell the pay-per-view, but boy, they get into it the next day. This is where we would see Paul Heyman cut his uh, infamous promo on Vince McMahon that I guess a lot of people could even refer to as the first pipe bomb promo. Uh, Heyman is going to tell Vince that he hated him just like his kids do. And he says that Vince is used to having Patterson and Briscoe kiss his ass all day. And that he used Hogan's blood to build Titan towers. Ooh. He destroyed Bret Hart to buy himself a private jet. He ruined Shawn Michaels smile and made himself a billionaire. And he talked about how Vince's father went around the country telling all the promoters he wouldn't compete with them. But when he died, Vince drove everyone out of business, stealing their ideas and making money from them. He said that Vince got most of his ideas from himself, stealing his dreams and his legacy and his ideas. And when he said, when Vince was using doink, he had Austin drinking beer in ECW and he talked about Vince would flaunt his affairs in playboy and how his family hated him for it. And he said, Taz was a wrestler, but Vince thinks wrestling is a dirty word. And he turned Taz into a no good color commentator. <laughs> Taz then came in and choked Heyman out to a huge baby face pop. And Meltzer would say, this was the excuse to get rid of Taz as an announcer. And of course, Jim Ross came out. Vince then yelled at Heyman saying the Alliance will choke on Sunday, but my goodness, they're letting, uh, Heyman have a lot of leeway here with Vince. Yeah. Uh, did Vince know everything that was going to be said, or did he just say, give it to me good or what have you? Oh, I'm, I'm sure they went over some of the finer bullet points, Connie. Uh, I wasn't in the, that 
particular meeting. It's good for me not to, it's good for me to not know all those details so I could react in an organic in a real way. Yeah. Uh but it was stiff. <coughs> Pardon me. And it certainly was a uh, pipe bomb like moment. We refer back to the CM Punk pipe bomb as being epic, still talked about today. Uh but don't forget this Heyman one. If you're going to go back and watch some of this show, watch Elements. That's an element that you want to check out. Cuz it was a heavy duty, heavy hitting uh promo. I remember a lot of the talents wondering if Heyman was shooting, you know, I, I, I admire, I I've always admired Paul's moxie, but he ain't that stupid. He ain't going to go on TV and say all these things without it being cleared at the home of office. Of course. Uh, so come on, but he did, he executed, he, he came through with a hell of a promo. So, uh, go to our, uh, our, our Twitter feed right now. We're going to have it linked, uh, today on Thursday as you're hearing this. Uh, over at JR grilling. If you want to see it, I want to mention Eddie Guerrero is arrested for a DUI around this time and winds up being released just two days later. And we know that this is going to be where Eddie takes to the Indies and really rebuilds his image and his brand and makes a, a big impression on a lot of young guys like CM Punk who's working the independence at the time. And, but this is one of those deals where you as the head of talent relations have to make a tough call. Uh, when you find out about the DUI, what do you remember about the the decision and how we got there? And then ultimately having this conversation with Eddie. Well, Eddie had, you know, had those uh, substance, substance issues if you found out later on and he needed some help, but he, he was in denial. He felt like he was fine. He didn't need any help and we needed to correct or help him solve his issue and get some relief from his, uh, the substances. That's why he was let go. He wasn't let go because he, he all of a sudden overnight became a poor worker. Uh, you know, he was still one of the best in the world. And, uh, you, as a talent guy, like I was, you know, we the same analogy with flair. If you get a chance to get Rick flair, sign him. If you got a chance to get Eddie Guerrero healthy and get him back in the fold, you try to do that. But it, again, the old two to tango cliche is applicable here as well. Uh, and I had a lot of talks with Eddie, Eddie was in deep depression and he had a lot of issues and, but he, you know, you recognize these problems and he, and he come up with solutions. Hey, we'll get you soon. And wrestlers didn't want to hear about getting counseling. Oh my God. And I admire John Moxley for what he's done. The courage it takes to stand up in front of your peers and your, your world your fans, your family, your wife, uh, friends, everybody is extraordinary. So I have, I'll always have amazing respect for John Moxley and we all should. Uh, so, but Eddie didn't want that. Didn't want to go that route. It was in today's world. He probably would have, because it's more accepted, but then it's some sign of weakness. And uh, so that we, we made the only decision that we could make because he didn't want to change. And I told him, you know, as long as you don't want to change, we're not going to be able to use you because, you know, the things he did Conrad required finite execution and it's very easy for Eddie to get hurt or hurt somebody, uh, because he's just a little bit off because when he, you know, he wasn't a mat wrestler, he couldn't mat wrestle, but he was all that high flying stuff that he did. He could either hurt himself or hurt, uh, his opponent. And remember what happened when he first got here. He did a frog slash and, and tore up his going. shoulder. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, anyway, that's where we were there. And I loved Eddie. I still love Eddie. You know, it's funny. Uh, Eddie's uh, anniversary of Eddie's death act ironically in Minneapolis was this past Saturday while we were all in town. It was brought to my attention that he, he died in the Marriott one block away from where we stayed. And I thought it was, and I, and I know that it was made specifically that we are not to stay at the Marriott because that would have been, have been hard for a lot of people to swallow. So we yeah. stayed at another hotel, still downtown Lowe's right across the street from the target center. Uh, and, and, uh, which is beautiful cause you can walk across straight to the building, but, but we, we really, we really respected that with Eddie and the, and it's funny that a lot of the talents today, Conrad still respect Eddie, like he was alive. Yeah. Still, still in the locker room, all those things. Uh, so that's shows a great love and respect that he earned, but, uh, we made sure that that Marriott was not in the picture 
And if I'm not mistaken, it's the same hotel that Brian Pillman died in in Minneapolis. Oh, I hope not. So we got out of that whole Minneapolis, that old Marriott thing. And, uh, and that was one of the reasons. And that's the sensitivities of Tony Khan. I've had owners and bookers that would have give a shit. Right. I got the best rate there to Marriott. So that's where we're staying. I, uh, unfortunately found with a Google search that Brian Pillman passed away at the budget motel. Oh, was it now the La Quinta in Bloomington? So whew, that would have been tough if that was the same story. town. Yeah. Same town. I, I, I'm off there. Thanks for, for doing that uh, research, but I know Eddie was at the Marriott. So, uh, that's why we had no desire to stay there. So, uh, it was good. And, the, and that Lowe's is sold out. You know, if you didn't have a key, uh, just as a, like, you're a fan, you sort of come over and hang at the bar. Uh, I, I don't think that was happening. So, uh, cause if you had been the little, the bar was small, it's, it was smaller than your bar at home, <laughs> which is also, it's like a ballroom in, in Huntsville. Listen to you, you and Briscoe got to stop all that. Let's talk about the survivor series. Here we are. The show itself is the 15th presentation of the survivor series. It's in Greensboro, North Carolina. We've got 10,142 fans there, which is about 50% capacity. Yeah. $594,000 at the gate. Another 91 grand in merch by comparison, survivor series, the prior year had 14,753 fans in Tampa, 779 grand at the gate, another 114. Uh, at the merch stand, it's just amazing what a difference a year makes. And boy, we start with a pretty, uh, talented duo. It's Christian retaining his European title, pinning Al snow in six and a half minutes. The match was made on a challenge during the heat pre-show Meltzer would say it was very good for what it was. And the live crowd, which was hot all night was into it. Two and three quarter stars is the rating from Dave Christian hits the unprettier after several near falls for the pin. Kind of a throwaway match, but still good action. Yeah. And, uh, Al snow with his presentation was over here. And obviously Christian was so two talents that the fans can, you know, right. identify with get behind and get us started here. Christian now two great pros. Al snow still is, uh, the head honcho there at OVW. Now I guess Al owns it, uh, and, uh, great, great instructor. You can learn a lot from Al snow. But there are two great pros. And of course, Christian is completely after an absence of several years, seemingly from the mainstream, uh, has, uh, really evolved beautifully in AEW. He had a great match, part of a great match on when on a Saturday night. So it was a good way to start the show. It kind of set the tone for some good wrestling. They're going to be solid. They're going to be fundamentally sound. And both those guys did that very admirably. Let's talk about the next match here. It's a uh, William Regal beating Yoshihiro Tajiri in two minutes and 59 seconds. Meltzer would say it was good while it lasted, but again, too short. Regal got something like his third bloody nose of the week. Tajiri did a few hard kicks before Regal ended it with a double arm suplex into a power bomb. After the match, Regal gave Tajiri a second double arm into a power bomb. And that's when Tori Wilson came out and he gave her one as well. So <laughs> star and a half. I, I, we love these guys on camera, their skits and whatnot on, uh, raw or just show stealers every single time. Yep. Two very talented in ring performers too, but awfully short under three minutes here. Yeah, it was, uh, just like that phone call that came in spam deal. I hate those son of a bitches. There's gotta be some app. Everything's an app. I should have 10 apps that allow me to block anything that's spam related. I'm sure there is, but you got to hunt this and drag that and click here and add your social security number and your birth date, your sperm count, all those things. And I'm not interested in not get, dividing all that information up. What, what is your sperm count these days? I don't know. It's pretty good. I'm going to take I, your word for it. Last I checked. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't have, I don't experience those, uh, that particular emotion a lot. Nowadays, what's on my mind and what's going on, but maybe I ought to kick out. Uh, I love both those guys. Yeah. Again, you know, you've heard me say Conrad, the most, the most valuable 
quality a wrestler can have for me to be attracted to and want to sign in those days was reliability. Yep. And man, you could not rely on two men more than, uh, William Regal and to, to Jerry, to Jerry was so had both those guys had amazing comedic timing. And here's the other thing. They both had amazing facial expressions and that sold a lot of their work. So it was short that when you got the last match going, you know, between a half hour and an hour, or it was 40 something minutes, uh, timing is a big issue. We probably book one and maybe you could even make an argument, Conrad, that we booked too many, too, too many matches on that show based on how much time the main event was going to require. It's a so, little weird that, that we feels like based on what we just saw, I mean, with him, you know, doing a move to Tajiri after the bell and then doing one on Tori feels like we're setting him up to be healed, but the next night he has to kiss Vince's ass to keep his job. That's where we it's start. Weird. Yeah. Crazy, right? Doesn't make any sense. No continuity. And, uh, you know, yeah, I remember that very well. I I'm a member of that club. We're going to talk about it next week. That's what we'll be. Oh, good. I can't <laughs> wait. It was such an edifying, <laughs> valuable experience in my career. When my face got buried in Vince McMahon's ass crack, mm. but what do you do? What, if the coach tells you to run this play, Conrad, what do I, what's old JR do? He, he runs run the, the goddamn run the play. fucking play. Yeah, that's it. Well, the next play is uh, edge pinning test to win the intercontinental title and retain his U S title in 11 minutes and 17 seconds. And that ends the history of the WCW U S title, which moving forward will be dropped. Um, Meltzer would say ironic end for both WCW, which was spawned by Jim Crockett promotions, whose best city was Greensboro. And the U S title was created in 75 for Johnny Valentine. When George Scott wanted to change the territory to a singles territory, it had always been a tag team territory. And it was really put on the map when Valentine beat Harley race for the title in the very same building. So nice little footnote in history here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, three and a half stars edge gets the win. Meltzer called it a very good match, which if we're honest, not speaking ill of the dead, Meltzer didn't usually rate test matches very well, but he really liked it. So nice showing by test. And as you said, sometimes it's not who goes over, but who gets over Test looked great here and edge went over and the U S title is no more. I kind of felt like, and it may, it might, I might be overstating this and you know, we pro wrestling announcers never overstate something, never, but I might be overstating this, but I think. That night was a real coming out party for edge. Mm. I thought he made a giant step forward in his singles career. Cause remember the, the vast majority of the edges exposures on television were with Christian as a tag team. So here he is, you know, how are you going to dance by yourself? The solo dance, not the tag team dance, etc. I thought really edge, uh, elevated himself in that match and Tess should get credit for part of that. But I know edge had a lot to do with. Uh, the mechanics of the match and the fact you got two Canadians who had a lot of respect for each other. They're both from Ontario. They both known each other a long time. Uh, it was just a, a good, uh, coming together of elements that would contribute to making this match good. And it also showed us that just how great edge could be and would become as a single star. And he still is today when he, when he's utilized, he still is a, a major player. So a lot of respect there for Adam Copeland and uh, always one of my favorite guys. Are you surprised that edge didn't wind up in AEW? Uh, no, not really. Not really. You know, he's got a brand established in WWE. It's the home for him. Uh, he's comfortable there. He's got a really good open established open communication with Vince, which is a crucial, uh, I would look, I look. Would I love to have had him in AEW? Hell yeah. Are you kidding? Absolutely. But I just think that, that WWE for him after all these years was home. You know, when I signed him and, uh, and Christian, that was their big goal. Their big goal is young wrestlers, young guys, training, uh, young guys in the Indies throughout Ontario and beyond uh, was to get to WWE. So I, 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 I understand his motivation. But yeah, man, again, that's like that same thing about the flare question a while ago and our, and all these guys, you got a chance to get them, get them, but he's just, uh, uh, Adam, just, he's, he's a, he's a lifer there. 
And, uh, would I like to see Adam Copeland have one match in AEW someday? Of course I would. Most fans would, and you yeah. and I would, you would too. For sure. Is it going to happen? Unlikely. Yeah. H highly unlikely perhaps, but, uh, that would have been kind of cool if he had come to work for us, but I understand why he did what he did. And I think he made the right decision. Let's, uh, let's talk about the Dudleys. They're going to retain the U S uh, or the WCW tag titles and win the WWF tag titles. So they've, uh, united the belts here when they beat Matt and Jeff Hardy in a cage match in 15 minutes and 45 seconds. There's some crazy spots here, including Matt Hardy doing a Russian leg sweep on Devo and off the top rope while the cage balanced them. Uh, and then we would see Bubba do a Bubba bomb off the top rope with Jeff. A lot of, uh, a lot of history between these two tag teams. And this yep. is a war 1545 Meltzer dug it three and a quarter star, uh, three and a quarter stars. And, uh, Matt and Bubba are going to climb to the top. Matt escapes, leaves Jeff in by himself. Jeff gets pounded on, but makes a comeback, climbs back over the top with Bubba laid out on the table. And instead of climbing over, does a swanton off the top of the cage. Of course, Bubba moves. So they do this table explosion spot and he's pinned. Jeff wasn't seriously hurt. Although from a logic standpoint, Jeff came across like a real idiot having the match <laughs> one, but instead blowing it by jumping off the cage, Jeff did a stretcher job with the idea of selling it to uh, keep him off TV three and a quarter stars. what do you think of that creative where you've got this daredevil. He could just simply climb down and win the match, but instead he opts to, uh, make the big impression, even at the expense of winning the match. Well, the cage is there uh, as a elaborate prop to facilitate the spots that we just talked about. Yeah. And, uh, so that I don't, so I guess what I'm saying is those guys would have had a phenomenal match with unique creativity. Uh, you know, you got, you know, Bubba Dudley's got a great mind for wrestling. You know, he's, he's a, uh, He's, he's a, he's a very strong willed, uh, can be stubborn, but that's cool. Uh, but Bubba and Devon and, 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 and the Hardys, they had danced so many times together that maybe the cage was there just to facilitate the spots and to perhaps make the match different. Uh, but I, I thought that maybe, uh, we were right at the end of that rivalry. People have seen everything. TLCs and the return TLCs and all these things, Conrad, uh, but two great tag teams without a doubt. I just don't know that the cage is needed. Uh, and, but I, I really, I enjoyed, I enjoyed, I've never had a match with the Dudleys or the Hardys that I didn't enjoy calling. They just always delivered the goods. They're all total pros. And for Jeff to be willing to do these career threatening moves. Yeah. Uh, was just extraordinary. He's almost too giving and he's, he dodged the bullet on that night. Cause he, he could have very easily been destroyed physically uh, in that match. Thank God he wasn't, but it certainly was a uh, possibility, but, uh, I always, I love those guys. They were great soldiers. I enjoy Bubba and busted open radio on, uh, throughout the week on Sirius XM, uh, and, uh, you can, if you listen, which you should, he, he, they directly do a great job. It's like, uh, you'll hear Doug Bubba's intellect his booking, breaking down bookings and matches. You might not agree with all of it, but he's got, he's got a reason for how, why he feels the way he does. And to me, that's, a, that's very, 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 very valuable. Just still saying, you know, all the creator killed us. I got screwed or whatever. Uh, I don't, I don't get that with Bubba. Bubba's a smart guy. So, uh, I'm sure he had a whole lot to do with getting this match laid out. And, uh, and then you got the, Matt and Jeff, you know, they're willing to do anything. And, and, and Devon's going to be mirror what, Bud, what Bubba wants to do. So it was really good. I thought it was really good. I thought it was melts at it three and a quarter stars. I thought it was a little bit better than that. Quite frankly, it is a little ironic too, after that big spectacular bump that we would see Jeff take, it's actually Matt who winds up getting legitimately injured here. The Dudleys knock him into the cage and they nearly knock out his front two teeth and badly split his gums here. But thankfully, uh, everybody's okay. Um, ain't ballet, Connie. just to put some perspective here, 
Uh, the tag champs for the WWF in 1998 were the new age outlaws and the tag champs for WCW were Rick Steiner and Kenny chaos. So these two develop, uh, these, uh, tag teams have, or divisions have developed a little differently. Next, we would see test win a battle Royal in seven minutes and 40 seconds, basically a rush job. According to Meltzer, he would say not awful, but no better than a usual battle Royal. And, uh, Sean Stasiak was actually dumped out before the bell rang to even start the match, but no one's complaining about that. He says, <laughs> Taz came in late, got a big pop. Hugh Morris and Chavo jr. Also came in late. He came down to test and Billy Gunn of all people with test kicking gun over the top for the win. So Tess had two, two matches here. He loses earlier, but boy, he comes back and, uh, wins the battle Royal. It's only a one star, but what could you expect with a battle Royal? But Clearly Vince saw money in test. Yeah, he did. Well, test had the great hit Vince's look. Yeah. Big, tall, muscular, uh, tight body, all those things. And, uh, and Andrew, uh, was not a dummy and he made personal decisions that were ridiculous and it eventually took his life had an effect on his life ending prematurely. But as far as having a conversation with him or talking the business with him, things of that nature. Uh, uh, Andrew was a very sharp guy and Vince could pick up on that deal. He was well-spoken. And again, he had all, he checked every physical box, six, 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 five, whatever he was, had a great body, looked good. Uh, but, uh, he, he, it's just, so Vince has saw something. He saw something. I saw something when I signed him, but. I, I just thought he needed a lot more polishing. That's all. And that's not a, that's not an insult. He's got to get better. He's getting more reps, but, uh, yeah, Vince saw something in test because test test checked all the boxes. Next up, we see uh, Trish win a women's title match in a six way over Jackie jazz Lita, mighty Molly and ivory. So to recap, we got six ladies here and they get four minutes and 35 seconds. Yeah, that was a, that was a travesty. Uh, and you know, I've often talked about the importance of, uh, Jackie Moore and jazz and Lita, Molly, Holly, uh, Ivory, Lisa Moretti, how important they were to establishing a different look and presentation than the days of Moolah, uh, and, and, and company. And somebody's a big Moolah fan. I know we've got some out there. They're going to say, well, you knocked Moolah. I'm not knocking Moolah. It's a different style. It's a different style. And, and, uh, and what Moolah did all those years, cause she had a stranglehold on women's wrestling and had a strong relationship with all the promoters that booked her girls, uh, as any promoter would have try to have if they could, uh, but we need to change. And again, Vince wanted me to sign athletic tens, but to get those tens over, uh, which Trish was Trish needed help. She needed experienced hands that could lead her along the way to keep her from making mistakes or getting hurt. And, uh, but this match was simply designed, uh, to get Trish over and, uh, and, and, and she came through with flying colors as she always did. Trish, a great athlete. She just didn't have the experience that she needed to get to that top level and stay there. Uh, it was a journey for her, but the, the ladies that I mentioned, uh, they're also in this match was a part of that journey and should always be given some credit and recognition or what they contributed to WWE in that era. Well, we should also mention, uh, Meltzer had this to say the only real port of interest was whether or not Jim Ross or Paul Heyman would mention the name of the last women's champion, China. They didn't, uh, I assume, you know, this is not something that has to be explained. You just understand they're not here. They're not going to be a part of our plans moving forward. So, All right. Just don't talk about it, but, uh, yeah, it's worth noting. This is, uh, <laughs> return of the women's title after China leaves the company and you finally have enough talent to get it started again. And I guess it's common sense that we don't mention her. And before you know it, it's the main event and boy, is it a long one? 44 minutes, 56 seconds. We've got the rock, the undertaker, Kane, Chris Jericho, and big show representing the WWF. Meanwhile, team Alliance is made up of Rob Van Dam, Booker T Shane McMahon, Steve Austin, and Kurt angle and team WWF wins in 44, 56, 
before the match, Vince would give his guys a big pep talk and talk about the legacy of the WWF, including people like Buddy Rogers, Dr. Jerry Graham, Andre, the giant gorilla monsoon and Peter Mavia. And, uh, well, plenty of time four and a half <laughs> stars when it's all said and done. Austin's going to hit rock with a stoner, but there's no referee angle shows up, hits Austin with a title belt, saving the day for the WWF and rock scores the pin with a rock bottom. And eight months after WCW died, 10 months after ECW died, their names within the WWF were officially taken off of life support and allowed to die with no dignity after a branding manslaughter. Ooh. Meltzer says, Wow. Hey, uh, wax, waxing the poetic there. <laughs> he is man. You know, and listen, you, you've got a lot of talent here. The rocks, a hall of famer, the undertaker's a hall of famer, Kane and Jericho and big show, all hall of famers. The other side, the same story, RVD Booker T Shane McMahon, Austin, Kurt angle, but it just doesn't feel like the right ingredients and maybe the right time. And they say in business timings, everything. Yeah. what do you think of this one? Watching the back for the first time in a long time. Well, uh, again, the thing that strikes me is that how much talent were involved in the match. And when you're trying to create an environment where everybody can have a, sh some, some level of shine, different increments of time, obviously, uh, I've got my 30 seconds. I get, get here's your 30 seconds. It wasn't that way, but everybody needs to have a shine. Everybody cause all those guys you, you were perceived. I, I think maybe I'm being biased of main event level guys. They're all stars. Uh, I, I like the fact that Vince, cause there was some consideration about that, uh, of have making an elimination match and I was all for it and I was not in the majority. I thought it would be great for, for guys to lose to somebody else's finish or, or get weakened by somebody's finish or whatever, but better than just the, you know, simple over the top rope spots. And, uh, so ha having a, an elimination and so you got missed, you got odds, like in hockey, a power play golden hockey or something. You got, you've got guy, you got a team that has one more player than the other. They have an advantage for now. Oh, all of a sudden now we're back to four versus four, whatever it may be. So I, I, uh, was amazed that the, there was enough continuity in that match for it to make some sense. Again, you got to share some time across the board. So everybody gets a little bit of a shine, uh, those that are losing, especially, and everybody's going to lose one guy. So how do you manage those spots? And there's where I would say a guy like Patterson came in and really uh, was able to, uh, add some order and some continuity and, and some degrees of logic as well. Pat was a very much an innovator in the old San Francisco battle Royal with Roy Shire, the promoter out there Pat had done a lot of these things where a battle Royal was once a year. Or so as I understand it, in the cow palace. And, uh, so Patterson was able to, to pull it all together with, with, with help of others. I'm sure Jerry Briscoe was involved and it was a team effort and it had to be a team effort when you got so many egos and so many stars in place at one time. So I, I, I thought it was well-managed and well-structured. But, but that doesn't take into account. Were we ready for this angle? Were we, were, was the audience prepared for this? Apparently they weren't aware. They weren't ready in Greensboro. Look at the attendance, you know, Shivani and I worked our first match together on TBS at clash one. And we had, a, we had a lousy crowd, but I think it might've been bigger than this one. I'm not sure, but uh, something happened along the way in Greensboro that just, uh, shot their toes. And that may be one of the reasons that uh, there's not been a significant amount of pay-per-views held subsequently, uh, in Greensboro, great wrestling city. I was at all when I got in that arena, cause I'd watched the ACC basketball tournament from that venue for years when Michael Jordan was a pup when, as a, you know, he won the, he, he, he was a star of the game as a freshman in the NCAA finals. He had all those great basketball teams from Tar Heel and beyond. But it was very disappointing to walk in there and see all the empty seats. Yeah. Cause, cause goddamn Connie, there was a bunch of them. It really is, um, one of the more, one of the more debated and discussed angles and matches and payoffs and storylines and history. And, uh, apparently 
there's some folks who aren't thrilled. Um, do you remember there being any heat on Shane McMahon? You know, well, not that anybody would come forward and say, I'm sure there's grumblings in the locker room. You know, somebody got left out of the match that had more experience and was quote unquote, more deserving. I'm sure that occurred. If it did, it was, it was, it occurred behind closed doors. Uh, I only bring it up because Meltzer says there was quote unquote secret heat afterwards, whatever the hell you go on Shane McMahon, because of not only how lame his firing on raw was, but because he took everyone's finish the night before, including a tombstone, a move that's basically unofficially banned for regular use and was helped out, but then didn't sell anything the next night. Yeah. And good. Angle came back from a stretcher job and didn't sell that on TV the next day. So it's Meltzer says it's not just a boss's son problem, but it does feel like that's something that the guys can't be too loud and proud about because of who he is. But it's certainly implied here in the observer that some folks weren't happy. Well, I, I think the, the, the implications made by Meltzer was probably pretty accurate. There were guys that didn't understand, you know, why another guy wasn't in the match instead of Shane, uh, the lack of selling. Was that in that in in it, this, it, the the quintessential? I got to look strong, and talents don't understand that by selling. You are looking strong because if you're selling, you're in the ring trying. You're trying to compete. You're trying to win the game. It's like Herm Edwards. The goal is to win the game, and that's what uh, that, that's what I how I would look at it. But to look strong, oh, we must be strong, strong like bull. Uh, it, it takes away from the presentation. And, and talents in today's world, one thing I could say to younger talents, don't let selling intimidate you. Use it as an asset and, and use it as, a, as the guys that can really, why do we always talk about when people sell, the great sellers, two names always come up. Let my family save your family some cash. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but we will save you money. It's not a matter if it's a matter of how much save with Conrad.com. I guarantee you know who they are. Sure. Ricky Morton, Ricky steamboat. Yep. They made a living being great performers, which includes being a great sales, do great sales jobs. We saw that Saturday night in Minneapolis. So many guys sold. It made the matches infinitely better because they were selling and reacting and they were, you could feel the hurt. You could feel those punches and that's for Kingston and, and CM Punk, for example, some people, I saw some people bitching about, well, they only had uh, 10 minutes. No, they had more time than that. If they needed it. The issue is that both of them came to the conclusion that a real fight's not going to last 20 minutes. That's correct. And so going 10 minutes of intense intensity and con constant movement and punishment and all those things, uh, were, I thought was spot on, uh, you know, I too would have liked to see more cause I was enjoying what I was watching and calling so much, but I did understand the fact that you can't have a, a fist fight, uh, for, and I thought I use the Lord's name in vain in that and just popped out. I apologize, uh, on during the show. But I, I, I just selling is it's such a crucial thing. Selling is one of the items that you could list right at the top of your list that made full gear. Great talents, selling, telling a story and selling is a part of the storytelling process. And any dresser that believes that it makes them look weak, really, uh, don't get it. They just don't get it. It's all about me and not about the match. And that is total bullshit. We didn't have that Saturday night whatsoever. Rarely do. That's the best I recall. Our guys sell like, like crazy. They they're learning. They're seeing what it results in. So, uh, but I, I, uh, the, the other thing about this match, I got in one match, Conrad, I got, I got 10 guys to pay 10 payoffs are going to be, uh, divided from one match. And that's challenging because you say, well, you just pay everybody the same. You don't pay everybody the same. Are you kidding me? Come on. So er, there's a, there's very, and, and you know, all the boys are going to talk and that's when they embellish their payoffs. <laughs> What'd you get? Well, I got this. What? 
and they, and, you know, I've had that happen more than once. So what do I do? I bring both guys in. Did you tell him he made blank? Yeah. Why'd you, why'd you lie to him? Oh, just come on. JR. I was, it's only a rib. It's always only a rib rib it on the square. One of the great traits of a wrestler, but that was another challenging thing. Paying these guys on a pay-per-view that didn't do great. The pie that we should cut up the slice for you to sl a slice for Conrad, a slice for, uh, you know, Eric Bischoff and all these dudes, all of our guys and on your, on the ad free uh, network. It, it, we have a different pay schedule, uh, it, but the bottom line is you still got to pay all these guys something fair because they, they want a pay-per-view main event payoff, whatever that is perceived to be in their minds. That's what they are expecting to the point where probably some of them had already spent that money, but they perceived they were going to get, if they fall short, then there's issues. I don't remember there being any mass mutiny. I just remember that getting to this, uh, number was really hard and, uh, and, and to where you feel good about paying guys, uh, and to what they hopefully will be happy with all the while knowing that nobody, can you think I can make 10 guys completely happy? No. no. So you just do, you do your best, man. You do your best, be honest and upfront and fair. And sometimes your my definition of fair was a different definition, uh, of, uh, the talents. Uh, and when it comes to money, cash and creative, somebody said that it's a big deal. It's the, it's the big ills. If you're going to, if you're, if you're on the outs, it's usually one of those two things, cash or creative. And that's a fact. And the creative here wound up like it always does rock versus Austin. And, uh, angle turns his back to, to, to being a baby face kind of, uh, at least for one day, we know where it's going. Uh, we'll keep the story going, but. The Alliance is finally put out of their misery. And so is Paul Heyman. Uh, the next night on raw, Paul Heyman's fire. Jerry Lawler returns. And what do you know? Ric Flair makes his return to the WWF. Um, I guess you had to make sense of it and you had to have him return on raw. It wouldn't have made sense at survivor series, but Flair in Greensboro, if the timing was right, would have been awesome. Uh, but we'll cover Lawler's return. Paul Heyman's firing the reset of creative. Flair's actual return after a nine year absence, Vince McMahon becoming a heel again, and so much more when we pick up the pieces next week for a November 26, 2001 episode. This is famous because, uh, well, this is where you kiss Vince McMahon's ass right in the middle of the <laughs> ring. And wouldn't you know it? It's just, Oklahoma, this is recorded now. It makes me feel good for this. <laughs> Oklahoma no, city. So of course <laughs> we got to do something to Jim Ross. That was par for course for a long time there. Oh yeah. I knew that was going to happen. Uh, is that, what did they do to me that night? You remember other than kissing Vince's ass? Was there any more insult to injury? I can't recall. We'll find out next week, but, uh, my, goodness. I'll tell you this. So as many of the talents can probably vouch for, cause they kiss it all the time. He did have immaculate cleanliness. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> my kids are going, dad, why did you do that? Oh, I don't know, honey. It's just what it was. <laughs> That was daddy's job, baby. That's right. That's why those Christmas presents keep coming. But these they days, it... JR's got a much better gig. It's JRsBBQ.com. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we've talked about it for a long time here. The all purpose seasoning. A lot of people are going to be cooking next week, Jim. And, uh, if you're not sure what to put on your Turkey, may I recommend the all purpose seasoning? It's good with everything, right? Jim. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Conrad. And, uh, we've got. We spent Stephen Link and I spent a lot of time on, uh, our sales, uh, packages and to fit every budget. They're great stocking stuffers. So, uh, for y'all, those of you listening and don't want me to drone on about why you should buy the, our products. It's obvious why you should buy our products because they're good. Yep. And I want to share them with you, uh, uh, and, and, and make some sales. But the bottom line is if you're a wrestling fan and I, I can't imagine somebody listening to this show, that's not a wrestling fan. It's a great stocking stuff. It's a great gift. It's a, it's a, you know, we got these packages together that we've got to get a sampler, so to speak. You can buy them individually, a la carte, if you will, my boy, I love the a la carte. Uh, and, uh, so JR's bbq.com. Uh, we're, we're ready. We're ready for your holiday shopping. And hope if you're ready to 
to, uh, to venture into our world. And if you've been putting off buying some products and you hear us talking about it incessantly, which we do, I apologize for that. Uh, then I would say, uh, uh, this is time to try it. Give us a shot. And we're, we're working, we're waiting on that. Uh, it's coming soon. I promise you, uh, we've got the labels have been approved. Everything is ready. The most important thing that the products developed, it's ready to go. And that's red SJR's hot sauce, which is really a, a byproduct of what we do here. I didn't go crazy today yet, but bottom line is it's a, it's a good time to sample, good time to try us. And we appreciate your consideration for any holiday shopping that you want to do with us. It's a, it's very, uh, we're very grateful for the opportunity. We're excited about jrsbbq.com. Something for everybody. The original barbecues, the hot barbecue sauce, the Chipotle ketchup, the main event mustard, the jerky, and my favorite, the all purpose seasoning. Check it out right now. Jrsbbq.com. And don't forget next week, man, it's going to be here before you know it. A very special Wednesday dynamite right before Thanksgiving, right there in Chicago, the uh, unofficial home away from home for AEW. And uh, Jim and I will be back next week talking about Vince McMahon's kiss my ass club. I have a feeling I'll have more fun <laughs> with that one than Jim Ross will, but I'll be fine. I've got, I've gotten over. It's only taken me 20 years. I don't hold <laughs> grudges. <laughs> I settled I put my ego aside, believe it or not. It was heavy. It's so heavy. Oh my, my, uh, it was so heavy, but I've done it. And, uh, it's more cathartic to move, move on. I've learned those lessons, uh, throughout my 69 years of life. And a uh, big week for me next week on a medical front, big week for going, I'm going to make it to Chicago come hell or high water. At least that's my goal. And, uh, I really appreciate everybody's the outpouring of support that I've been getting on social media is extraordinary. It's heartfelt. And I can't tell you, uh, you know, I'm never alone, even though Jan's not here, I got our audience, I got wrestling fans and I got a lot of them. And I'm not saying that braggadociously, I'm saying that out of thanks and gratitude. So I'm never alone. And I really appreciate everybody's support and the, the good wishes are, are, I read them all. They come across on Twitter at JRSBBQ. You can bet your ass. I'm going to read them. I may not respond to all of them, just out of time and all that stuff, but I really do appreciate it. Makes me, uh, it lets me know I'm not forgotten by the masses and I don't plan on being in a position to be forgotten. So. Nonetheless, Conrad, interesting times, you know, it's just part of the journey. We talk about that all the time. How do you, how do you, how do you navigate your, your specific journey in life? And folks, a lot of you are that way. I get a lot of, Hey, I get, I get social media stuff about Bell's palsy. I get it about different things that I've, and it's amazing. People realize they remember my medical history, which is got to be crazy, but nonetheless, uh, I, I do appreciate everybody's support as it's, it warms my heart and gives me motivation to go on. Well, we're excited that we're going to be going on next week here, talking about Jim Ross joining the kiss my ass club. It's going to be fun. Stay tuned boys and girls. We'll see you next week right here on grill and Jr. with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross Conrad, always great to be with you. It's always even better to be with our audience. We appreciate the, uh, uh amazing support Conrad's, uh, ad free shows.com is dominating the, uh, podcast rankings globally. And, uh, that's a combined effort of a lot of people that you don't even hear about. You don't even see, uh, he's got a great staff and, and all the boys, uh, you know, Arn, Kurt, all the fellas, Eric, Tony, Tony's books getting ready to come out. That's another stocking stuffer, but you buy that after you buy my shit. <laughs> JRZBQ.com. We'll see you guys next week, right here on grill and JR. Thanks everybody. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.